My name is Wade Stevenson and I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Marketing. I have a very easy job this morning. I have to uh, introduce BioFire to you, let you know uh, what it is, who we are and what we do, and then uh, introduce our two speakers who will uh, are, are the reason that you came here. So really quickly, BioFire Diagnostics, uh, we have a very long history of uh, uh, innovation. We started off literally in a barn. It didn't look anywhere near that nice of a barn, trust me. Uh, in 1990, we've uh, invented a series of life science and defense, uh, and then eventually in the uh, early part of this decade, got into clinical infectious disease diagnostics, uh, changed our name to BioFire, and uh, now we do syndromic infectious disease testing. Um, yeah, with the long-term goal being we want to uh, eventually transform ourselves from being a diagnostic company and become a healthcare company. So, what is syndromic testing? So there's a few definitions out there. This is BioFire's definition. Um, it's a symptom-driven, broad grouping of probable pathogens into one cause. So for infectious diseases, we take uh, the most common, the most probable pathogens associated with an infectious disease syndrome, combine them all into one uh, test and uh, run them all together in a very user-friendly rapid turnaround time. So this test is very simple to run, two minutes of hands-on time, an hour turnaround time. So we feel this maximizes the chance of getting the right answer in a clinically relevant time frame. We have four uh, of these syndrome, infectious disease syndromic panels that are FDA cleared and available on the market today. The first one is our respiratory panel. Uh, you can see it uh, has a list of uh, viruses and some atypical bacteria that are generally associated with uh, upper respiratory tract infections. We have our blood culture identification panel, uh, which is designed to detect Organism. The winner of this morning's iPad drawing is Ahmad Banjar. Ahmad Banjar, you have two minutes to come to Critical Connections Cafe and collect your prize. Congratulations, Ahmad. All right, the blood culture identification panel designed to uh, detect what's growing in a, in a positive. Uh, the, winner, the winner has collected their prize. Please come back this afternoon for our last drawing. Nice job, Ahmad. All right. The uh, third product we have on the market is the uh, gastrointestinal panel. Uh, this is a mix of uh, bacteria, parasites, and viruses, uh, all associated with uh, gastroenteritis, uh, infectious gastroenteritis, as well as a, a pretty healthy list of uh, subtypes of diarrheogenic E. coli slash yellow. And the last product we uh, launched is our meningitis panel. So for patients with uh, a meningoencephalitis, a potential presentation, uh, a great test for ruling in or ruling out a lot of the suspected pathogens associated with that syndrome. Um, very uh, easy to interpret results. You list out everything that was tested for. You put a check mark by what was positive. And uh, it's an hour turnaround time. It's all automated. Very simple. Uh, my last slide is uh, just where we're going. I'll point you to the uh, that little icon there on, on the uh, on the far right, the pneumonia panel. Uh, we expect to submit that to the FDA here in a couple months. Uh, the trial is done. Uh, it'll be our first product that is semi-quantitative and uh, knock on wood, uh, FDA cleared, hopefully, uh, on two different sample types, uh, BAL and Sputa. All right, that was the shortest week, right? We have the great pleasure today of hearing from uh, two uh, Great speakers uh, who have ample experience with our products can really help you understand uh, how it has benefited them in their institutions and particularly uh, in their in their ICU. So first we'll hear from uh, Dr. McKinnis, who is the Chief of Staff Elect, uh, Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at SSM Health St. Anthony in uh, Oklahoma City. And then uh, after Dr. McKinnis, we will hear from uh, Dr. Hurst, who is a uh, PharmD, Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship and uh, Clinical Pharmacy Specialist of Infectious Diseases at the same institution. So they're colleagues. And I think uh, we did that on purpose to give you a really good multidisciplinary perspective of how infectious disease syndromic testing uh, can benefit uh, an institution. So uh, 
after uh, Dr. McKinnis speaks, we will, if there are any hot burning questions, take two or three minutes for one, two questions, but we do want to you know, put a hard stop on that and then get on to uh, Dr. Hurst's comments. And then at the end, uh, we'll open up for a broader uh, Q&A. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Gregory McKinnis. Good morning. Thanks for joining me this morning uh, as we talk a little bit about syndromic testing uh, in the ICU. Uh, I'm an intensivist. I run an intensive care program, 36-bed ICU in our uh, urban and tertiary medical center in Oklahoma City. Uh, and work for uh, in a disclosure with bio Biofire Diagnostics. We're going to talk a little bit today about viral respiratory illness in a hospital system. Uh, we're going to understand maybe the difficulties in achieving an accurate diagnosis in these patients who present to acute care setting with respiratory symptoms and talk about the concept of syndromic rapid diagnostic testing with regards to that illness. Uh, then we're going to talk about maybe what you may be most interested in and some case studies from our medical center. And these case studies are all within the last six weeks that we, they were easy to find. First of all, the requisite slide on respiratory tract infections, uh, hospitalizations for acute respiratory illness. It includes pneumonia, influenza-like illness, bronchiolitis, uh, over a million hospitalizations per year. This year is probably higher with all the flu going on, with a tremendous cost to our healthcare system in the United States. We know that respiratory illness uh, has viruses that are comorbid in many instances. Community-acquired pneumonia, 20 to 40 percent of community-acquired uh, pneumonia cases you, you can detect virus. And we know in COPD and asthma, as viruses play a critical role in these exacerbations. But probably more importantly, and what we're seeing this season, is that viral illnesses, especially the flu, predisposed to the secondary bacterial infections that we're dealing with in the intensive care unit and are likely precipitating factors for organ dysfunction. We've seen and heard about myocardial infarction, CHF exacerbations, but also probably in the in venous thromboembolic disease as well as diabet loss of diabetic control when patients have viral infections. Now Clark and his group in 2014, in a United Kingdom sample, tested over 800 patients who were hospitalized with acute respiratory illness. 44% of those had detectable virus by conventional PCR testing. Uh, but bacterial illness was uncommon with the exception of COPD and clinical pneumonia. And not unexpected viruses played a critical role in asthma exacerbations and acute bronchitis as well as influenza-like illness that required hospitalization. Now, I'm going to refer you to this website, syndromictrends.com, for a, kind of a, a, just a beautiful, I'm still, I'm still, uh, still uh, enamored with shiny, shiny, bright, colorful objects. And this, uh, on occasion, and, and this slide is really slick, is that it's an aggregate of nasal pharyngeal swab testing uh, from the BioFire device and film array for the respiratory panel. And you see over two and a half years worth of data, and you see really a seasonal predilection or prevalence of the uh, particular viruses. And, and you often see that flu is not the big player here. Uh, but you can toggle through this slide, and it'll give you the various percentages that are at play across the country with res regards to various types of illness, including coronavirus, adenovirus, flu, et cetera. So we know that it's very challenging to diagnose these patients. The overlap of symptoms is significant. We deal with viral issues, bacterial, CHF exacerbations, interstitial lung disease. We know that we have sputum culture problems. The patients recently were on antibiotics a lot of times. Out of the urgent care, you don't even know what they were treated with. We have trouble collecting these sputums and obtaining uh, an idea of what's going on. And we know also that sputum cultures may not reflect actually what's going in, on in the lower respiratory tract. Uh, similar BAL limitations 
when you're dealing with ventilated patients in non-immunocompromised -immun hosts. With immunocompromised hosts, BAL plays a critical role. So Wade discussed briefly, and I'm going to tell you where, where I see, rapid diagnostic testing, just a couple of definitions. It's where you use a dipstick or a cassette to achieve rapid results, minutes to a few hours. But syndromic, the word syndromic to me was new. I don't know why it should be new. I knew the word syndrome. It's just an adjective of the word syndrome, but I, I learned it about six months ago. Uh, and it's really, when you look at particular disease patterns with a symptom profile, exam, lab findings, so you can focus your testing. It might be respiratory, it might be GI, it might be meningeal, as Wade alluded to. But this is what we mean by syndromic testing. Because pretty much everything we deal with in the infectious disease, we're doing syndromic testing. So if we think that there might be an infection present, we like to focus our testing in a, in a particular direction. Traditionally, patients present with their symptoms. This is how we grew up. This is how we went to medical school. They're rarely specific, obtain relevant cultures. We observe for a response to some empiric cocktail of antibiotics that are tailored to that history and we hope to see results and we don't see results we change the flavor of antibiotics we do more testing sometimes the lab results aren't available for many days but what we do all have is an expectation that in the lab the pertinent pathogens pertinent pathogens are isolated and identified with great accuracy but really deep down inside we know that's not the truth and that's been proven we know that chest x-ray has a low sensitivity compared with CT scans, although CT scans seem to be the only thing that really happens with regularity in the, in the emergency room these days. The ultrasound has some promise, but the intra-observer reliability or the kappa value is quite low. Uh, and we reserve bronchoscopy typically for patients with hemoptysis or concern for malignancy, unresolving infiltrates, etc. Traditional viral testing, 2006, 2011 data, turnaround times are huge. Uh, two cultures, average, uh, this is uh, data out of Journal of Clinical Microbiology, 199 hours. Uh, there are plenty of people my age, and I'll give you a free donut if you can guess my age, but I've been around when they were doing shell biocultures, and I didn't realize how long they took, but I knew they took a while. This is an average of 49 hours. And in the early 2000s, a lot 2000s, we had direct fluorescent antigen, and it's still available for testing for a, a small number of viruses. And then along came the rapid antigen detection for influenza and RSV, 15 to 30 minutes, although at a price with sensitivity. So again, what do we want for our patients? We want a rapid and accurate diagnosis. We want to know. We really don't want to know what's going on behind the closed door of the lab. We just want to know that it's right, that it's accurate, it's rapid. Because that's the only way we can really achieve improved outcomes in infectious disease and achieve the shorter duration of symptoms if we know what's going on. And when patients know what's going on, even if there's not a treatment for it, but we have an answer for it, you do get improved patient satisfaction. And fewer complications is one of our, our goals as well in terms of decreasing antibiotic use and avoiding their side effects. So new tools have become available. Uh, these are fairly new in my mind, but this has been around for, as, as Wade discussed, for some years now. But BioFire multiplex PCR testing allows the rapid and accurate diagnosis to achieve that appropriate therapy. and it allows things to be fairly seamless. Like I said, I didn't know we had a biofire machine until about six months ago, and we were getting some of these answers very quickly. Uh, but, but, but getting that rapid and accurate diagnosis, for most of you, what's relevant, it's critical to an antibiotic stewardship program. <coughs> so it's become a mainstay in our hospital and in respiratory disease. I'm gonna talk about the respiratory panel. We get rapid results with high sensitivity and specificity overall. This is the updated version of the respiratory panel, the RP2, was released last June. 17 viruses, uh, and I say viruses, there's some subspeciation going on there, 
and back, some atypical bacteria, the Bordetella, was added to this particular panel. So the film array works very rapidly on the lab side as the lab tech, uh, basically there's a small pouch where you load the sample. Uh, there's no measuring around. You put the pouch into the BioFire device, otherwise known as a film array, and you start the run. The improved aspect of the RP2 panel, the respiratory panel 2, uh, the second panel that was released, is you can get results in about 45 minutes. So I'm going to change gears to talk about a few cases uh, in our facility. Uh, these are cases when I was, uh, I was on, because uh, I still am doing a fair number of shifts even though I have director responsibilities, uh, and I met this patient in the emergency room. He's a 61-year-old gentleman with history of mild COPD. He's a former smoker. He was seen two weeks ago, two weeks prior to his presentation with a respiratory illness. His son tells me that he had albuterol and antibiotic prescribed, but they stopped the antibiotic two days later because he had some kind of a rash, which was, which was not still present. He was in severe distress for less than eight hours uh, and presented to initially urgent care, and they said, keep going, you're headed to the emergency room because you're hypoxic. He presented with a respiratory syndrome of respiratory distress and hypoxia, and he required intubation after a brief attempt at bypass. Here's his chest x-ray and in this case the right lower lobe has the pathology. It's nicely encircled by the telemetry leads so it's a little heads up. Uh, and furthermore his white blood cell count was sky high, 55,000. His procalcitonin was elevated, his rapid antigen influenza testing was negative, and you see to the right, this is what shows up on our EPIC EMR, the rapid influenza testing on the left, and in, in the darker uh, is the respiratory panel array. That was also negative. That was about five o'clock in the evening, and they also did a CT scan, by the way, and you can see he has necrotizing pneumonia uh, and possibly some bronchiectasis. It's kind of hard to tell until some of that clears but a, a very obvious infiltrate. He was started on cefepime and vancomycin, as is the case for our severe, uh, our patients with severe respiratory, or, or severe failure, uh, respiratory failure and suspicion of pneumonia. Uh, he was also started on IV steroids and some bronchodilators. And the next morning at 8 a.m., we had a positive blood culture. The sputum gram stain also was positive, with gram positive cocci and gram negative rods. And here is what resulted out before noon that next morning, because once they had a positive blood culture, they threw it in the blood culture biofire array and got a result rapidly. And you can see the results showed a methicillin sensitive Staph aureus. But, and this is a, another a picture from our, from our EMR. The sputum culture a few days later did show Pseudomonas, a pan-sensitive organism in addition to methicillin sensitivity. So two weeks prior, what did he probably have? He probably had influenza or some type of virus that opened the door to this bacterial illness. So he did really well. This guy the following morning was extubated. Antibiotics were trimmed to cefepime alone, which covered the pseudomonas as well as the uh, methicillin sensitive Staph aureus. And an ID specialist arranged some outpatient therapy to complete a course because of his necrotizing pneumonia. A couple of points I want to make about this case. We have a rapid identification of a positive blood culture in less than 24 hours. We respected the gram-negative rod on the gram stain. The symptoms uh, are you know, fairly uh, nonspecific. He presented with acute respiratory stress and was intubated. He did have a right lower lobe infiltrate and he had a leukemoid reaction with a white blood cell count of 55. By the way, I did do a peripheral smear and there were no immature cells on that. But it allowed us to give precise antibiotics in this case. Uh, influenza was ruled out and he was spared a course of oseltamivir. And you might ask, why did we even do the respiratory panel in this case? We already had a negative rapid antigen assay. Cost somewhat similar, probably a little cheaper to give Tamiflu, honestly. 
But I will make the argument that I'm a little old-fashioned as I like to know what I'm dealing with. And we have some issues with sensitivity with the rapid antigen assay. If it was non-flu season, probably wouldn't get any of this testing done. We probably wouldn't have tested for flu. We might have tested for the, for the other viruses, but he had a right lower lobe infiltrate. But when you have such a high prevalence of flu, the negative predictive value of rapid antigen test goes down. And so, again, I would like to know what I'm dealing with. I think I'm still of a very traditional camp. I like to avoid anti-infectives, if at all possible. But there are, you can make strong arguments that everybody gets put on Tamiflu, and you've seen that in some of the ICUs for patients with severe respiratory illness. Case number two is a 61-year-old woman with a BMI of 32. She's got a lot of comorbid illness with COPD and a, a bad ejection fraction and diabetes type 2. She also had been seen three days prior for an exacerbation of her COPD and treated with antibiotics and prednisone. But her symptoms, her respiratory syndrome symptoms progressed rapidly, cough, dyspnea, and wheezing. Her presented to our emergency room earlier this month by EMS and required intubation after a trial of BiPAP. And here's her objective data. You can see she had a fever. She had a white count that was elevated. Her BMP was not elevated, so we really didn't think her congestive heart failure was playing a role. Her rapid antigen assay was negative. She did have a positive lactic acid consistent with severe sepsis, <clears throat> but her procalcitonin was only minimally elevated. And here's a chest x-ray like you, not the ones you see in the case, case presentation. Do you see this in your ER all the time? The, the pacemakers covering up a third of your left lung, your heart's borderline, you have severe scoliosis, uh, and you probably have some fibrosis there. And you can see the ET tube is already in position. So how does she get treated? It's 5 p.m. She gets started on Typical sevapine vancomycin. She'd been treated as an outpatient with some unknown antibiotic. <clears throat> she was treated with IV steroids and nebulized bronchodilators, uh, and her sputum did, crow, uh, did show the following day three plus gram positive cocci. Now, interesting note is at 5 p.m. we started on therapy. That's when I saw her in the emergency room. At two, and I ordered a nasopharyngeal the test because we had a clear chest x-ray and didn't quite understand what was going on. Uh, that swab was not done until 2 a.m. She'd been in the ICU for a few hours by then. Uh, that was for the PCR testing. Two, uh, less than two hours later, they called the nurse on the, in the ICU with an influenza A, and that's what showed up. So here we have a negative rapid assay and a positive PCR test. And we immediately started oseltamivir. And this patient, I'm not trying to bring you all her success stories, but she did do well, and we had to extubate her the following day. Uh, her cultures remained negative at 72 hours, and we were able to discontinue her antibiotics and just treat the flu uh, in her case. So a couple of points I want to make. Nasal pharyngeal swab testing delays are not uncommon. It's something you have to stay on top of as a clinician. And it certainly isn't gonna get done in the emergency room unless you go and stand on the neck of the, of the team down there because they're busy doing other things. Uh, and a really a strong point to make is the sensitivity of the multiplex PCR is, uh, is significantly greater than from the rapid antigen assay. But proper collection techniques may have played a role. And I encourage you, if you have not looked up videos on how to properly perform a nasopharyngeal swab, you need to look that up. It is not a pleasant experience if you're doing it correctly. Uh, rapid diagnosis allowed rapid de-escalation of antibiotics, and the procalcitonin being nearly normal gave additional confidence that there was not a bacterial lower respiratory tract infection present. And, and I will say, since my, my ID partners are not here today, that we avoided consulting them in this case, but you could easily see where they would be involved fairly rapidly if we had not made this diagnosis with all the comorbidities of this patient. So a quick comment about procalcitonin. 
had to remind myself where this comes from. Obviously, it's a precursor of calcitonin. It's in the thyroid C cells is where it's made, but it's also made in the lung and intestine, the neuroendocrine cells of the lung and intestine. It's elevated in patients with bacterial lung infections, but most critically, it's not elevated in fungal and viral infections or infections with intracellular organisms such as mycoplasma, pretty much what we're testing with the RP2 panel. And, and I find it most useful, really, in our de-escalation decisions in the intensive care unit because it has a significant negative predictive value. So, quick rundown on the third case. So a patient I had followed in clinic for a few years, uh, and then she showed up in our intensive care unit. She's a 62-year-old woman. She's on dialysis with chronic kidney disease. She has some asthma slash COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, the whole gamut uh, of what we'd expect with major comorbid illness ending up in your ICU. She had had two days of a respiratory syndrome, right? She had a cough, weakness, and wheezing. But additionally, she had had two weeks of abdominal wall redness. She had a large panis, and it was very red and hot, and she had not missed any dialysis. When the EMS found her, she was very hypotensive and in res respiratory distress. When she got to our emergency room, her white blood cell count was elevated at 16.8. The rapid assay was negative, but she did rule in for a non stemi or troponin leak. It was 1.85. And remarkably, her lactic acid was not elevated. Her procalcitonin was 2.76, with a reference of less than 0.5. And she was treated with the sepsis protocol, antibiotics, IV fluids, cultures. Here's what her x-ray looks like. It's almost uninterpretable in the lab. Very hazy, a lot of fat tissue, and a very enlarged heart. But the CT scan showed a left lower lobe infiltrate. We don't know if that was chronic or not. I mean, she, she had been in our system before, and she always, lied on, she always lay on her left side, and so that was something that probably never gets cleared anyway. But the testing with the PCR shows she had coronavirus. So the rapid assay for influenza is negative, the other viruses are negative, but coronavirus was positive here. And we think, well, she was treated for abdominal wall cellulitis, okay, possible pneumonia, completed this course of therapy and, and stayed on schedule with her hemodialysis. She was continuing to require suppressors, actually. But a couple of notes I want to make, that comorbid viral illness is common. I started out the talk with that. I'm going to finish with that. It's very common, and it leads to, de to exacerbation of underlying comorbid chronic illness. It remains difficult to exclude a bacterial respiratory infection, especially if there's no sputum production, among other sampling issues. And in this case, we avoided using oseltamivir because we knew what virus was at play. But overall, it, it added to our local understanding of our seasonal viral burden. You know, we've been going through patterns of seeing human metanuvirus, coronavirus. Uh, these things uh, are instructive. So in summary, viral illness, tremendous burden to our healthcare system. Uh, knowledge of these viral infections is very, and is contributing, and contributing factors to the underlying illness is very important because it helps us better understand a comorbid disease course, an exacerbation of COPD, an MI, etc. And, and knowing what's going on helps us track local prevalence patterns. We, as clinicians, need the ability to provide rapid and accurate diagnoses. And we achieved this with PCR testing because it's got a high, very high sensitivity and specificity. And I will say that, that it's critical to get these answers uh, to help with antibiotic stewardship, to help with treatment decision, and achieve the positive outcomes that you're looking for. So I'll open it up to a couple of questions. <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> right. But 
Okay, so the question is, we're doing testing and we're finding these viruses that are really interesting to find out. Uh, and do you do the droplet precautions once you find out that you have adenovirus, coronavirus? And I would say yes, we do. And we've worked very closely with our infectious disease specialists to treat it in terms of like the flu. So about seven days. And once the seven days of symptoms or in the ICU kind of is completed, we stop all that. What we were finding is we were putting all these patients on isolation and then the skilled nursing facilities didn't want them because they're on isolation. And that really interferes with kind of moving patients through your hospital, right? That's a real problem. But we've come up with a kind of an approach that made it more reasonable. Yes? I don't, I, this is a, this is an infectious disease syndromic pattern, but Wade can answer, maybe what he's looking at. I'll, I'll answer that real quick. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, the technology analyzes DNA and DNA, whether it's from you or from a pathogen, is DNA. Uh, strategically, though, BioFire decided, at least for the foreseeable future, to focus on infectious diseases. So, someday maybe. Move on to Dr. Hurst to talk about his the role in the antibiotic stewardship program. Thank you, Dr. Dix. Here's my disclosures. All right, so the team approach in implementing rapid diagnostics is what I was asked to really bring today. Um, I am a infectious disease pharmacist. I attend multidisciplinary rounds a couple days a week with Dr. McKinnis in the ICU. At the same time, I'm working with our infectious disease doctors, hanging out in the micro lab, looking at basically every result that we're investing in off of these kind of technologies and trying to network with our clinicians. And my style of stewardship is really a relationship-based handshake stewardship. I like to go see people and talk to them about their case. I think it is a two-way communication. I try my best not to be the scary guy who calls with only negative news of why are you doing this so um, give you a little context on how I approach stewardship at St. Anthony Hospital. Um, so you come to a conference you find this technology you find what um, Dr. McKinnis said inspiring you say I want to take this home. Um, how do you do that? You need to identify a leader. You're going to need someone to shepherd this through your institution. Um, who could that be? It could be your antibiotic stewardship team, it could be an ID farm D, it could be that you have an ID physician who's got some time set aside to do this. Um, since we're here, it could be a critical care farm D that's interested, um, depending on the practice site. Maybe they want to just tailor it down to they're going to champion their part of it, uh, their part of the hospital. If you're an intensivist and you have some spare time and you're up for it, then I threw your name on this slide because you're here at this conference but uh, probably not the best use of resources. Um, or maybe you're really innovative and you say, hey, we're really pinching pennies, healthcare's getting tight, and we're gonna you know, hire someone who maybe doesn't get paid, but a pharmacist get paid, or a physician gets paid, and really um, develop someone else to be in that position who might save you a couple dollars in the area. So a huge part of bringing this home and how we work as a team is we spend a lot of time fixing the front end. Um, Leadership support and buy-in is extremely important here. Um, you're gonna need to break down some silos. We all like to say, well, this is critical care's budget, this is pharmacy's budget, this is lab's budget. Well, I'm about to spend some of lab's money, and the lab is not gonna be the one who sees the decrease in length of stay or in the pharmacy drugs we are no longer given. So the administrator who is responsible for those different silos or different departments needs to understand and we all need to sit down prior to and have a conversation of we're going to invest here for better patient outcomes, better things, but we're going to have some shifting of costs and we're going to all have to understand what's going to happen here prior to getting the bill at the end of the year and being like, what did the lab do? Because um, they don't appreciate that. Um, microbiology lab turnaround time. So you say, hey, we want to you know, turn on this great technology, but um, I haven't done any work on getting my specimens to the lab and maybe I have multiple facilities and maybe there's a courier running once a day from across town and so that blood culture might have sat there for 23 hours. Um, 
you know, that's, these are the easy things you can fix. You need to, you know, fully look at the uh, path of the specimen to the lab and how quickly we can get that there as well. Um, one part that gets often overlooked is the medical, uh, medical record reporting. Um, this is where you can make huge wins. Does what lab says, does their um, jargon or um, their information that they're putting out there, does that translate to the same thing that clinicians read? And in my experience, I've found not always. Uh, lab thinks, clear as day, I'm saying this. And clinician thinks, I don't know what they're saying, I'm gonna wait for the final result. Um, and so really working to you know develop what it's gonna look like beforehand, and then take that out to some clinicians and say, hey, when you read this, what does this mean to you? And you might find that you're surprised that uh, we don't always all uh, get on the same page. So you can do yourself a world of benefit to help um, different practitioners who might not be as experienced in infectious diseases understand some of these results. Your result notification process might need some changes. You say, I'm gonna do this for blood culture. Well, do I want to get a call with the gram stain when the blood culture turns positive and an hour later get the result that, oh, it's MSSA? Well, I just put them on bank for gram positive coxillin clusters. Probably not. Um, you know, if your patient's sick enough, they're probably on empiric therapy. It's probably broad enough, so you probably want to wait for that biofire answer. Um, and how you communicate that is important. And then uh, results reflex actions. So things like contact isolation. Um, and you can streamline that. It's part of the process. It automatically um, can be a filter down effect as soon as that result is called to the floor. The nurse initiates the protocol for contact isolation. Maybe you're real progressive and you find that you have a certain organism and you want to stop double coverage. You know, it's not Pseudomonas, it's E. coli. Okay, let's drop the floor one of them. We're not there yet either. Um, so, one example of uh, optimizing reporting. This comes into us from a remote facility in Oklahoma. Uh, rural town, not all that uncommon. Uh, this is a print-off straight off of one of their automated instruments. This is a methicillin sensitive staph aureus bacteria. You get this nice laundry list of antibiotics and sensitives and resistant to penicillin but sensitive to oxacillin. Very typical. Now, this is a bacteremia. What if we choose to use erythromycin because we don't know enough not to know that's okay. Or what if we have someone checking results for us to say, hey, just make sure that you know every antibiotic report we get back that uh, they were discharged on something that was sensitive and it never gets to the clinician. Should that happen? No. But does it happen? So at our hospital, what would you see on a staph aureus bacteremia, whether MRSA or MSSA, you're gonna see oxacillin and vancomycin, because that's what we want you to use. We try to um, communicate our message as succinctly as possible. Now, if I'm in a different part of the US, I might have dapamycin also on there. Um, but this is, um, you know, definitely we don't want to see tetracycline for a staph aureus bacteremia. Uh, that ends very badly, so the superfloxacin, we've had that occur in different settings and people being transferred in um, and have suffered the consequences of that kind of discharge um, had endocarditis or metastatic infections of the spine due to inappropriate antibiotic selection. Um, while the technology is extremely impressive, it's not the magic box. Implementation of rapid diagnostics as a sole intervention will do, I'm not going to Nothing's a strong word, but it won't do everything it can um, if not used appropriately. Um, it's critical to appropriately interpret results, and this involves also teaching your clinicians, um, including uh, your bedside nurses, how to communicate these results. That they're going to be all of a sudden going from just telling, uh, passing on gram positive cocci or gram negative rods to uh, Staph aureus detected um, with a MEC A, and the gram stain has gram positive coxide and gram negative rods. Um, and you might have to be able to um, basically extend their vocabulary a little bit. Uh, actively alerting providers of the results to have them acted upon in a timely manner. You're going to invest the time in the technology. You need to get that information to the person who can act on it. So, how did someone look at that? And then uh, 
successful programs have included antibiotic stewardship, um, and we'll see that here. This is at uh, John Hopkins. They turned on a rapid diagnostic PNA fish um, without a formal stewardship program, looking at streptococcal and enterococcal isolates. They looked at 220 patients, and they did not improve time to appropriate therapy, optimal therapy, or time to switching to from effective to optimal therapy. And that included isolates that were likely BRE, enterococcus species, um, which is usually BRE. Um, usually, even without a uh, stewardship intervention, escalation tends to happen, and we'll see that on some of the next studies. But uh, failing to do that is kind of impressive. Um, and so the study failed to find a clinical benefit in RDT alone. And so, Stewardship uh, added to this, so this is a three-pronged study in which you have a controlled environment with conventional microbiology, a rapid multiplex PCR added, and then stewardship actively acting on that uh, in addition. And you see our time to first appropriate antibiotic de-escalation is only seen when we have stewardship involved, an impact there. But escalations actually happen with just the rapid diagnostic alone as well as uh, the addition of stewardship and then time to administration of active antibiotics is lowest in the stewardship arm. And you see the highest percentage of contamination not treated also in the stewardship arm. So again, looking at sidestepping contamination, this is a uh, automated instrument in the pre-intervention, so something like a Vitec uh, 2, and then post-intervention with a rapid diagnostic like Molditoff um, plus antibiotic stewardship we see that the duration of treatment of coag negative staph is a day and a half lower in the antibiotic stewardship group. Vancomycin utilization is 1.8 days less, and so much so that the number of vancomycin serum assays attained goes from two to uh, just slightly less than one. Um, this came out in the past couple years. Uh, Joint Commission is now using uh, our surveying for antibiotic stewardship. So as part of the CMS, uh, those hospitals that are drug commission accredited will experience this. We had our mock survey this year and rapid diagnostics as part of our stewardship program were something we were able to point to as part of our uh, leadership commitment, uh, the support, supporting our prescribers in their management of their patients. Also, they want to see that you're taking an action. So what are you doing? So we pointed to, here's our algorithms for this. We're running every blood culture. We're following every result. We're documenting on what we're doing, what interventions are being made, and then tracking. Um, so we're able to take these and run reports out of them and report them back. Um, you know, and hopefully one day we'll be able to take this further into getting the patient outcomes tied to individual results. Uh, but we are looking at the resistance rates and antimicrobial utilization. Education is key here. Um, this is something new. It's new information. You're going to be asking clinicians to make a decision much sooner than they're used to. Sometimes we have the diagnosis in the ER. Um, you know, uh, meningitis. You know, we were able to diagnose this in the ER last year on a patient. Um, sometimes it's uh, you know before a lot of your hospitalists have seen the patient, and we're already telling them, hey, uh, they were started on vancomycin and zosin in the ER got a uh, bacteremia or we've got something already detected, um, you know, what can we do about antibiotics? And they're like, hold on, I haven't seen the patient yet. So um, we're much faster than we used to be uh, with this kind of technology. Uh, group and one-on-one -on -one education, we do the group as an introduction, but one-on-one -on -one we really sit down with people and go through it because it's complex and people feel a little more uh, apt to ask questions in that one-on-one. -on -one. We re-educate daily. Um, based on clinical cases. Um, hey, let me walk you through this. Um, you hear the least bit of apprehension or misunderstanding. We talk about it. We talk through it on rounds all the time. Um, and who to teach? We taught a ton of folks and uh, basically anyone involved with antibiotics along the way. This is the gram negative pathway. Um, this is something we post. This is extremely overwhelming, the most complex, but this is for the blood culture panel. And um, what this allowed us to do is post hey, without knowing anything about your patient, here's what we'd say if they were um, to have a result off the biofire. Now, 
we make a lot of caveats when we teach this that hey, this doesn't replace clinical judgment. If you get to the end of the row here and you've got a uh, sorry, a e. coli or an enterobacter that's not a KPC detected and it is um, no history of gram negative bacilli resistance, um, you know, use cefepim or ertapenem because it has an inducible MC beta lactamase. So we're you know trying to help them along the way to pick the best drug combination, but if you had cefepime resistant isolate last month, please don't use this, you know, use urban, use something else. So we go a long way in that education as well. So our impact on testing um, an antibiotic sturgeon, uh, this is a critical care conference, so it's mandatory to show this slide, I was told. Um, every, you know, appropriate antibiotics are key to survival, 7% decrease in survival for every hour after the first hour of the onset of hypotension, which led us to reducing time to effective therapy saves lives. So a proud moment for me, my resident was able to uh, go on after I had uh, sent him out to the world and do a meta-analysis published in Clinical Infectious Disease last year, uh, taking many of these rapid diagnostic studies together and found that mortality was significantly lower with rapid diagnostics than with conventional identification methods, with a number needed to treat as low as 20 to save a life. So obviously we need to start the right antibiotic fast, even if it's expensive. Um, you know, we're not gonna withhold daptomycin for BRE. Uh, we wanna get it on there as quickly as possible, even if it's expensive. Patients do better when they're being treated. Um, stopping antibiotics is also important. They're a waste of money and resources, and they increase the risk for adverse events and drug resistance. Every extra day on an antibiotic increases your rates of CRE. Every additional antibiotic increases your rates of CRE. So we want to avoid that. Um, and then contaminated blood culture. Um, it's something we continue to struggle with. Um, it's you know the bane of my existence because those coagulative staffs take five times longer to work up to see if it's real or not than an actual pathogen because E. coli is real pet and clear. But I gotta look through the entire history to see if I can find any prosthetic material in the body, you know, what's going on, and, and it's very difficult. Um, so my rapid diagnostics case I want to share with you today is a 70-year-old female presents with a chief complaint of increasing shortness of breath for two days. She recently completed antibiotics for bronchitis. It came into the ED five days prior um, and was placed on blood fluoxacin. Um, she's been getting worse though and comes back in. And she's not a current smoker, but has a 50 year history, but is unaware of any COPD diagnosis. So she has a past medical history significant for coronary artery disease. Her view of symptoms reveals cough, shortness of breath, breath, wheezing, and no fever. Um, she, her blood pressure is elevated, pulse is 115, respiratory rate is 22, and she's on some oxygen at 100%. She has wheezes in all fields, and her rapid flu is negative. Her white blood cell count, 9.6. Lactic acid, 1.9, and increases to 2.6. Her ABG is within normal limits. Her chest x-ray shows no acute cardiopulmonary uh, process and no interval change from the last ED admission, or ED visit. Um, so several breathing treatments are given. BiPAP was attempted unsuccessfully. Blood cultures are drawn. Patient was admitted, lactic acid, now 3.5. Biofire, film array, respiratory panel, and procalcitonin are ordered. Revealed human metanumovirus and a procalcitonin that is below the lower limit of detection for the test. And blood cultures are called to the floor around 5 o'clock with gram positive coxine chains. So we start antibiotics. We're getting nods both ways, and that's exactly what I expected. There's some of you who are thinking, I don't want to fail the sepsis orders, uh, the sepsis score measure. There's some of you who are thinking, I think you have to cover, and some of you are thinking, that procalcitonin is pretty low, and we've got a, a reasonable pathogen to put us down this process. So our biofire film array for the blood culture comes back Streptococcus species. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the technology in the panel, if you have strep species without uh, the subspecies, the species level data, if you just get the genus Streptococcus, 
Um, that means you didn't detect strep pneumo, you didn't detect group A, you didn't detect group B. Um, at our institution, unless you're presenting with something along the lines of a GI illness, there's a good chance that this is a beard and strep and potentially contamination. Um, pulmonologist holds his ground and withholds the antibiotics. Uh, blood cultures finalize as contamination with that beard and group strep with multiple morphologies, further indication that it was contamination. And repeat blood cultures are no growth. And the patient improves with steroids and NSAIDs and is discharged home. Um, real quickly, I was asked to touch on the future. And this is one area where, you know, we would like to see development. And uh, this is that pneumonia panel. Uh, and so what would this mean for us? Uh, many bacterial targets. Uh, as well as our atypicals, our, our viruses, and then resistance markers that are quite impressive. Um, you've got the MEC A, but you've extended it to also include MEC C and MREJ. Uh, we've got the KPC. We're now picking up the New Delhi metallobetalactamase, uh, carbapenemase, OXA 48 like, the CTXM, ESBL, VIM, the M. So, uh, very wide net of resistance markers here available. Um, again, like Wade said, it's going to be sputum-like or a BAL type isolate. And then semi-qualitative reporting. So what's this going to look like? Uh, you're going to get different pathogens and a logarithmic bin of uh, quantification. And then a final result would look something like this, where you have a detected acinetobacter at 10 to the 7th, a detected Klebsiella oxytocra at 10 to the 7th, might have uh, some atypicals, whatever. So what does this mean? What's this panel going to do? Uh, will it be the end of the sputum culture? No, you're still going to probably need to grow something up for uh, antibiotic susceptibility phenotype. But um, will it become a screen for the sputum culture? It might. Uh, will it be the end of vancomycin for pneumonia? We can only hope. Um, but. You know, there's a potential for significant influence there. And then uh, what would be more aggressive in obtaining respiratory specimens. And I think that's one of the main things we could see out of this is the fact that uh, so many people have started to dismiss respiratory pathogen or respiratory sampling altogether that um, you know, fewer than 50% of pneumonias admitted probably actually have this ordered. And then collection is even poorer after that number. So um, what impact will this have? I think it's a test that we're going to learn a lot as we get it out in the next year and we can start to play with this and see you know, what impact this has on our patients and what the clinical trial data says. And so uh, please, please, uh, this is my pitch for antibiotic stewardship, uh, 1944 Life Magazine, our first ad for penicillin to 2017, The Economist, when the drugs don't work. Uh, please protect these valuable resources, work with your antibiotic stewards. Um, we'd love to work with you. Norman says, cephalosporins don't cover enterococcus, don't forget that, and thank you to my family for letting me come out here today, and I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions.